In the midst of social distancing and business lockdowns, a freelance writer and a graphic artist bought a bus, converted it into a tiny home on wheels, and moved out of our four-bedroom house. One year later, we downsized to a Chevy Express. Now we travel between Texas and Pennsylvania from April through November while exploring small towns with rich histories. In the winter, we hunker down in Texas in our schoolie and dream of our next big trip. We're Alan and Teresa. And we're rolling with our Nomi. All right, so we are in Bonham, uh, Texas here today. And behind me, you can see the Fannin County Courthouse built in 1888. It's very similar to the Hood County Courthouse because it was built by the same architect. So the view of the courthouse coming into town is absolutely stunning. You round this corner of this curve and the highway, and there it is off in the distance. All you see is the courthouse, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And then you come into town and see everything else. So <laughs> I'm happy to be here. This is a beautiful town. They're very proud of their town here, and they should be. Uh, right here, uh, they just found out this past year that uh, Bonham is on the Jefferson historical trail and they're all excited about that because they've mapped it out and everything and uh, they didn't know that uh, the Jefferson Historical Trail Commission people uh, contacted them and said hey did you know your town's on the trail and so they're really excited about it and they're celebrating their 175th anniversary of the founding of the town now you can find out more information about that by clicking on the link in in the description we're yeah, linking so to them Today we're just going to go around the square, look at some of the historical buildings, catch up on some of the history of the town. It's a really neat little town. A lot of things have gone on here, so uh, let's check it out. Famous outlaw John Wesley Harden was born just southwest of Bonham at Blair Springs. He was the son of a reverend, uh, and that makes his life very interesting because we wonder, well, just how did this uh, preacher's boy end up being a gunfighter? Anyway, he killed his first man at the age of 15, and they say that he killed a total of 41 by the end of his life. A Texas ranger described him by saying, he kills men just to see them kick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Evidently, he could take two six-shooters, turn them like wheels in his hands, and fire a shot at each revolution from both guns quite the, the gunsman anyways he was arrested spent some time in Huntsville uh, he escaped uh, prison and took up cattle raising which he didn't do too well at he ended up back uh, in a life of crime uh, he also uh, while in jail studied religion and law and started a law practice of all things he was admitted to the Texas bar <laughs> But he wasn't very good at it yeah, at his, that either. His uh, law practice didn't do so well, so he ended up uh, going back to uh, crime and, and shooting people. And uh, interesting story, anyways. Yeah, and and he actually ended up back in prison, eh? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, he was pardoned in 1894, uh, and that's when he uh, he got out uh, of jail and uh, went to uh, you know. Because he had studied law in prison, started his law practice. <laughs> okay, then. And I thought they said uh, he was shot yeah. in the Acme Saloon. In yeah. 1895, he was shot in Acme Saloon by Deputy Sheriff John Selman. Yeah. And then buried the next day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So 20 years after the uh, end of the Civil War and Bonham, Texas was well known for its lawlessness. In autumn of 1884, a popular Fannin County constable was le uh, elected to sheriff. Tom Ragsdale won the office in the general election on the first Tuesday in November and on the fourth day was officially sworn in. Six months later, he received wait. He received communications concerning a shootout in Indian Territory north of Gainesville, Texas. 
the notorious Lee gang had ambushed, ambushed a posse headed by Deputy U.S. Marshal Jim Guy. Guy and two others were killed and members of the gang fled the scene. Ragsdale was told that two suspected members of the gang, brothers Sam and Eli Dyer, were headed to their homes south of Bonham. Hold on. Okay. So 11 days later, he was told they were seen there at the home. So Sheriff Ragsdale set about raising a posse of about 30 men, and with that large group, he was on acting orders from the U.S. government to apprehend the Dyers. When they arrived in the vicinity of the Dyer farm, Ragsdale had the largest portion of the party remain out of sight some distance from the farmhouse. Deputy Joe Buchanan was also near the neighbor to the Dyering farm, and the sheriff cautiously approached the house. They were met at the door by several women who deemed who denied having Sam and Eli. Without the cooperation of the family, the two men were forced into the dangerous situation of searching several buildings which surrounded the farmhouse. One old structure had a door fastened from the inside. As Ragsdale attempted to force the door, Eli Dyer fired one shot through the opening and entered Ragsdale's head in front of his ear. As Ragsdale fell, the brothers bolted through the door. Ragsdale was able to get off one shot, which hit Eli, who turned and fired again at the hapless man laying on the ground. By this time, Buchanan had come around one of the other buildings and was shot dead by Eli. <coughs> so the posse captured Eli, but oh poor old uh, Sam Ragsdale, taken to the Fannin <laughs> County Jail and placed in the, well, Sam. Sam. Sam managed to escape. Sam Dyer managed to escape. But then he was rounded up and placed in jail. The same cell where his brother was recovering from his wounds. <laughs> okay. At a preliminary hearing, the case was continue, continued because of Eli's wounds. So anyways, old Sheriff Ragsdale didn't make it. Right, right. Poor old guy. I still don't know what that had to do with that with that building. I don't either. Except that that's where they posted it. Right. Okay. All right, so the Civil War was waging in 1863, and the citizens of Bonham were quite aware of the blood being shed by their young men. One of the most compelling events concerned Captain William Quantrill, notorious leader of the feared band of renegades who operated outside of control of the Confederate Army. Quantrill was known to have wintered in the area of Bonham on at least two separate occasions. In late November, weeks after the bloody massacre of Lawrence, Kansas, perpetrated by Quantrill and his band, the group showed up in Sherman after crossing Red River at Colbert's Ferry. They spent a few days in town before setting up camp. And they set up camp near Big Mineral, northwest of town. In the meantime, General Henry McCulloch, commander of the northern sub-district of the Confederate Army, had his headquarters here in Bonham and began to receive dispatches from various levels of command of the Army. He was ordered to keep a... He was ordered to keep a check on Quantrill and his movements. Soon after, violent incidents including murder and robbery began to occur in the area. Quantrill's men, with good reason, were suspected. So they anyways, they went through this whole deal, they, ordeal. They arrested him. Searching for him and everything and eventually got him. But uh, there was a big deal. He was a uh, Quantrill. He was a uh, he was a real troublemaker. Just my kind of guy. Didn't he escape? He may have. 
I believe he over he got yep. his guns back. Yeah. They put him in the same room with his guns. Yeah. He re then he returned to the area after he left. Yeah. A shady character. But he locked up the 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 headquarters guys and and his soldiers told them they were all prisoners. So a lot of good things happened here in Bonham. A lot of bad things too, evidently. Well, look here. I'm looking at the Opera House. What you know about it? So this is uh, the Russell's Opera House, the oldest of Bonham's two premier opera houses. Constructed uh, hold on. on. Wasn't this guy just right there? He went around the block. He did. He went around the block to make noise in my video. Man, these people in Bonham, I'm telling you, the drivers here, they are not friendly drivers. No, they are. As soon as you walk across the street, they try to run you over. <laughs> they, they do have a tendency to not, not think about that crosswalk. Yeah, the crosswalk says walk, and it's loud, too. It says walk. Oh! Look, y'all, I got to get this little video. It's just <laughs> i tell you what, I don't know which is worse, the drivers or the wind. They both try to run you over. Yeah, those crosswalks are tell loud, me. too, Now, tell man. me about this opera house. Quick. You can walk. You can walk Quit right being... now. And then they try to run you over. Quit, <laughs> Quit being silly and tell me about this opera house. So anyway, the Opera House, <laughs> it was built in 1874. Yeah? Yeah. Home to locally produced productions. Yeah. That's, this is the Opera House where those folks from the hotel performed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, hey, they did stuff here. They did. They did. Bottom is a cute... A cute little town. You could walk all around it in about 10 minutes. It is a cute town. It's taken me way longer to walk around it the second time. But you can see they preserve their history well. They're telling a story with their with their roundabout town walk. And it's a cute story. It really is. And over here at the Dollar General, they had a showdown. <laughs> Was it the Dollar General when they had the showdown? I think, yeah, it's called the Dollar General Showdown. It was like an 18, No, no, it's 1859. not called the Dollar General Showdown. Like 1859. That or is not what that says. 1863. 1863, the Dollar General didn't even exist. I know they're popular now and they show up everywhere, but I don't think it was the Dollar General at the time. Well. General McCulloch arrived in Bonham in 1863. Wait, didn't I just hear about him? Yep, that's when he took command of the northern, let's see, the northern sub-district of the Confederate Army. Oh, Lord. Okay. That's a whole lot of words. Yeah. Confederates try to get better names for their division. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. One of his first charges uh, was to ferret out the large number of suspected Army deserters and possible Union agents who were believed to be present in the Red River Valley. Two of those agents were a father and son team, L.L. Harris and Cap Harris. So the 1860 consensus shows an L.L. Harris shoemaker and Wait, the 1860 Harris. census? Yeah. Okay. And it shows they were residing with the Miller family near the community of Orangeville. I think that's in southwest Fannin County? Yeah, somewhere here in Fannin County. Okay. So anyways, they were suspected to be Union sympathizers. In February 1864, Cap Harris was captured with a group of men from Bonham about a day's ride from Fort Smith, Arkansas. It was composed of Union sympathizers and Confederate deserters that were trying to reach Union forces. He was imprisoned for a month and then released and he was returned to, and returned to Bonham where the circumstances of his capture were well known. 
Okay. It's widely held that the Harrises were responsible for Dr. Penwell's arrest and his flight to Saint in his flight to Fort Smith. <clears throat> the affair came to a climax on this spot. Right here where Dollar General right over here, now right, stands. Right there. Nearly two years later in a showdown between the Harrises and Daniel W. Byers, a Texas Ranger serving as a Confederate Army Lieutenant. According to eyewitness J.H. McDaniel, he and Byers were walking along the north side of the square as they approached the law office of Colonel Samuel Roberts. Cap Harris jumped from the doorway of the Dollar General. He did not jump from the doorway of the Dollar General. When the Dollar General did. And he shouted, God damn you, draw your pistol, and began firing his own weapons. <laughs> Byers returned the fire. Another account says Byers and young Harris met earlier in the day when Byers swore at Harris and called him a fed. Well, those are dirty words. I tell you what. You fed. <laughs> Harris went home, told his father what happened, armed himself, <laughs> and returned with his father looking for Byers. After Cap Harris had fired the first shots, his father stepped between him and Byers and entered the law office where he told the men there, Gentlemen, I am a dead man. God have mercy upon me. And then he fell from gunshots exchanged between Byers and his son. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, see, interesting things happen in Bonham. It's a little bitty time for all this drama. Probably wasn't so little bitty back then. I mean, it had a streetcar. Anyways. It had a streetcar. You know, like Alan Jackson says, it's okay to be little bitty. <laughs> as long as you don't sing, we're all good. <laughs> But it did have a streetcar. One. It did. It did have a streetcar. And that streetcar stop was right over here on the corner. Dummy. Was it Dummy? Dummy. Oh, okay. That was the name of the streetcar. Well, Dummy stopped over here on this here corner. Yeah, that's that was where Dummy stopped in 1891. The Fannin County Commissioners granted permission for the Bonham Rapid Transit Railway for the right of way over any street or alley crossed by or along which this line might run. Okay. The interesting thing is it only cost five cents for a one-way ride on the, uh, the, the trolley. And, uh... And, and ten cents right for a, ten cents for a uh, round trip. Okay then. Yep. Okay. All right. So the first influx of settlers into Fannin County began in the early winter of 1836, when Dr. Daniel Rowlett brought ten families up Red River to a site about 16 miles northwest of Bonham, the present-day Bonham. Because of the ease of the river transportation, most of the families chose to locate their homesteads along the river. A year later, a second wave of immigrants began to spread over the interior of the new territory now claimed as part of the new, newly created Red River County of the Republic of Texas. In March 1837, Bailey English and a wagon train of 10 to 15 families crossed Rocky Ford Crossing of Bodart Creek at Red River and followed the creek's path to a grassy verdant valley near the confluence of Bodark and Powder Creeks. There a new settlement took root. After taking possession of their homelands, the pioneers began construction of their log homes and outbuildings from the plentiful oak trees in the area. About midsummer, a young man named Alexander Russell arrived. He hired some men to help him construct a spacious building and shortly after began to stock it with goods shipped upriver from Jonesboro and Fulton. In response to the perceived threat of attacks by bands of renegade Indians, English and some of his neighbors began construction on a two-story log blockhouse and surrounding stockade. Comprised of ten or more residential cabins, a general store, and the fort, the settlement became a viable village. 
In the early days, the village was called both Fort English and English's Station. By 1839, it came to be called Boyd Arc, after the water course just on the eastern limits of the settlement. In 1843, Texas Congress decided to move the county seat of Fannin County, which had been created from River River, Red River County in 1837, from its location at Fort Warren on Red River to the village of Bodark. Residents of the newly named Seat of Justice sent a petition by their representative, Dr. Rowlett, to Congress asking that the town be renamed Bloomington. The bill was introduced. A member of Congress made a long and passionate speech declaring that the heroes of the Texas Revolution were being forgotten and that no better way to sustain their memory could be found than to name towns and counties for them. And with that, they changed the name of Bodark to Bonham to honor the defenders of the Alamo. Okay. John Butler Bonham was a native of South Carolina. He came to Texas in 1835 at the urging of his boyfriend, a boyhood friend, <laughs> really? William B. Travis. <laughs> Soon after joining a company commanded by Colonel James Bowie, he arrived at the Alamo. Ignoring orders from Sam Houston to abandon the San Antonio post, Bowie, Bonham, and others chose to stay and defend the former mission. Twice during the two-week stage, Bonham slipped through Mexican lines, searched for volunteers to help him battle defenders. He tried to return one last time and took his place on the battlements. <laughs> we don't really know the circumstances of his death, but it's believed he died in an attempt to blow up powder magazines before the Mexican army could reach them. But he was never in Bonham. No. Oh, it was Lord. just named after him. Oh, Lord. Okay, then. Well, we're done here in Bonham, Texas. There's a lot more to see. We just barely scratched the surface. We hope that uh, if you're going through North Texas, the next time you go through here, uh, stop and pay these friendly folks in Bonham a visit. They are super friendly in their visitor center. Until they're driving. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they ain't trying to get you. You just got to watch for them when that little man in the box says go. Yeah, yeah. Don't take the man in the box's word for it. He's loud and he's he proud. He can see traffic. But he ain't watching for cars, so you got to. Alright, if I don't do this right, then my wife, I'm going to be on the bad side of my wife. So y'all bear with me and pray for me. But while you're doing that, don't forget, share us with your friends. Like us if you like us. Like us if you don't. Subscribe to the channel. It helps us out. God bless.